Thank you, everyone. Um, so as Alistair um, very kindly uh, introduced, my name's Addy. I'm currently working as a clinical research fellow in the UHB AI and Digital Health Group. Um, and today I'm going to be giving a brief kind of a roughly 15 minute talk on uh, post-market surveillance of AI as a medical device and some of the work that we're doing here in, in Birmingham to understand how to truly monitor the, the safety and effectiveness of, um, of AI once it's deployed in clinical settings. Um, and so I thought um, this is always a slide that I flash up first because it's it's quite nice and it shows the breadth um, of different AI medical devices that are coming on the market for so many different um, medical specialties. And so we're really seeing um, a lot of different technologies being developed and we're also seeing the potential of these different AI medical devices um, to perform various different clinical tasks such as uh, imaging, drug dosing, et cetera. Um, and, and so <clears throat> one of the things that um, we I've been thinking quite a lot about is how these technologies go from the development to the de deployment process and, and all of the bits in between. Um, unfortunately, it's it's not as simple as one would um, like it to be. Um, and there's a lot of work that goes into developing these uh, AI medical technologies and getting them to um, to market. And then even after that, there is a post-deployment monitoring phase, which is equally important. <clears throat> and so this is just a very quick snapshot of how the regulation uh, or the regulatory processes are structured um, in the UK. So we have the MHRA Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency. And within that, there is a software and AI group that are currently developing kind of a new framework for um, regulation of, of software as a medical device. Um, <clears throat> but essentially, the MHRA as the competent authority can um, designate notified or approved bodies um, to audit and approve various different medical devices, including AI as a medical device. And so this, in terms of this structure, when it comes to the post-market surveillance of AI as a medical device, um, there's a lot of different things that these notified or approved bodies would look at. And they are essentially responsible for um, auditing uh, AI medical devices and the manufacturers to ensure that they are compliant with regulation at the and that ultimately um, the AI medical devices are safe and they are still effective. Now, the, the, the challenge with AI is that there's um, various different levels of evidence um, available for regulator approved AI medical devices. And so it's not always the case that an AI medical device has to have prospective validation data, prospective evaluation data for it to be approved and put on market. And so that raises questions around kind of what level of evidence you actually need to get your device on market, but then how you need to monitor the performance and safety of that device after it's been deployed in clinical settings. Um, this is quite a nice um, diagram or kind of summary uh, diagram from um, the recently published reporting guidelines for early stage clinical evaluation. Um, and it essentially outlines the fact that there are various different levels of evidence, but um, the post-market surveillance stage is, is very important. And, and that's what we're looking at um, in, in here in Birmingham. And, and that's what some of the research that I'm leading on. Um, <clears throat> so, there, so we're seeing all of these um, novel and very um, novel technologies with great potential for things like um, mammogram classification, eye imaging, skin cancer, and many others. Um, however, one of the main questions and one of the main problems is really trying to understand how we can enable um, the integration and routine use of these AI medical devices whilst ensuring that they remain effective, safe, and inclusive post-deployment. Um, and so this, this was kind of described in two independent reports, the UK government, and there have been subsequent reports led by um, the Regulatory Horizons Council. Um, and two of the main problems that we're looking at here is, firstly, kind of how, how do we answer this urgent need to establish methods for error detection, analysis and reporting, or safety monitoring um, or safety assurance? Um, and what actually is an AI error and how does this lead to patient harms? And so we're, I'm, I'm currently embarking on um, three different work packages to understand 
uh, how best to monitor um, safety using a multi-stakeholder approach in clinical settings. Um, and the three work packages are firstly two systematic reviews looking at how AI errors and patient harms are reported at the moment. Um, and I'll come on to that, just I'll touch on that very briefly. Um, the second is understanding how these errors and harms could be detected and reported in practice and what sort of safety assurance mechanisms um, <clears throat> um, can be put in place. And then lastly, developing recommendations for a best practice safety framework. Um, and, and that's using real world deployments as use cases, um, which I will uh, again touch on briefly. So <clears throat> when we think about post market surveillance, um, there's a couple of really important uh, things to, to, to know about. The first is that post market surveillance is quite a broad um, umbrella term that actually covers various different activities. The first activity is, is routine gathering of data associated with effectiveness and safety associ associated with that medical device, uh, including AI. The, the second is if there isn't enough data, um, what sort of post-market clinical follow-up studies do does the AI manufacturer or anyone in that ecosystem need to conduct? And thirdly, <clears throat> what sort of vigilance processes are there? And, and the vigilance processes, what we mean by that is the reporting of errors or adverse events through various different um, uh, mechanisms. And so in terms of the adverse event reporting, um, I'm looking at a few different databases. Unfortunately, not all of them are publicly accessible and not all of them include medical devices. Um, but I have managed to identify those that do allow for searching of medical devices, and those include the FDA database, um, some of the data available from the MHRA, and also some data available from the TGA. And so I'm currently looking for AI medical devices with adverse events reported. Um, although I haven't completed the systematic review yet, I can tell you that there are far less adverse events reported than one would expect. Um, so yeah, keep an eye on that space. Now, the other way um, to monitor the safety and effectiveness of um, uh, AI as a medical device is really trying to understand how best to um, do this using a multi-stakeholder collaborative approach. And so part of my research, um, which I will summarize over the next kind of uh, 10 minutes or so, is looking at how we can implement the medical algorithmic audit um, which is a safety monitoring framework for AI as a medical device, how we can implement that and use that to provide the right, the right level of safety assurance for AI as a medical device post-market. Um, so just to, just to quickly summarize, the medical device, the medical algorithmic audit, uh, which was recently published, it was kind of early in 2022, um, it's essentially a five-step process that, that goes through um, the different stages of uh, understanding what the intended use of that um, AI's medical device is, why it was actually deployed, what was the intended impact. And then you essentially go through and map out the current, um, the current deployment pathway, including any clinical actions in that pathway, um, and then look at various different uh, testing um, and reflection stages. And, and I'll come on and describe that in a, in a little bit more detail uh, in the next few slides. So the use case that we were looking at first, and this is the, the first one that we've uh, attempted, so it's very much a, a pilot um, a pilot of the medical algorithmic audit in the context of a deployed um, AI algorithm. And so in, in University Hospitals of Birmingham, we have the Skin Analytics DERM algorithm, which is essentially a deep learning AI for recognition of skin cancer from dermoscopic images. Um, and so we, in collaboration with the uh, UHB um, digital transformation team uh, and Skin Analytics, we conducted a, a medical algorithmic audit of um, the, the DERM algorithm and presented this back to the uh, clinical quality management group within UHB itself. Um, and so how did we go about doing this? Well, so I'm just gonna talk about the five different stages and, and what we did in each one. Um, I won't delve into too much detail on a couple of the, the bits, but I'm more than happy to take questions afterwards. Um, so. The first stage is essentially scope the scoping stage, and that's really understanding what the intended use of that product is and what the intended impact of that product is within the context of its clinical deployment. Um, and so we 
uh, first looked at the intended use specification technical files, which we had access to through Skin Analytics. Um, and one thing to mention is that a lot of this was done in collaboration with the Skin Analytics post-market surveillance team, uh, who were vital in, in kind of providing access to a lot of these documents. Um, and so we looked at the actual um, uh, risk class and, and, and what sort of regulatory approval DERM actually has, um, which was... So it's, it's marketed as a class two UKCA uh, marks device. Um, the, we also looked at the role of human users and how autonomous this device is. And I'll mention that in, in the next slide. Um, and then we, we also discussed with various different stakeholders what the intended impact of DERM was. Um, it was interesting to compare the alignment between different stakeholders. So um, DERM was initially uh, deployed due to uh, COVID-19 and we needed to get patients into cancer clinics for skin cancer um, as, as soon as possible. And so that enabled that access to skin cancer clinics. Um, and, and lastly, we also looked at what the algorithmic audit um, should focus on. And it was, again, interesting to compare the different stakeholder priorities, um, especially thinking about what the medical algorithmic audit is de designed to do and then what some of the different stakeholders were hoping it could do. Um, and so I can tell you very much that cost effectiveness and um, and non-safety related aspects would be very difficult to, to look at with, with this framework. Um, so how is the um, Skin Analytics DERM AI deployed at the moment? Well, it's deployed as a triage algorithm. So two week wait referrals for potential skin cancers um, would come in from primary care or i.e. GP clinics. Um, and, and these images, so, sorry, these referrals um, would go to the um, booking officer who would then uh, send these patients to our UHB teledermatology hub, where they would have images of their um, lesions, their skin lesions taken. And those images would then be put through the um, derm skin analytics algorithm. And this algorithm would then tell you, is it cancer or is it not? Uh, or is there a higher risk of cancer or is there a low risk? Um, if there's a high risk, these patients are triaged straight to UHB in, into the dermatology clinic. If there's a low risk, they're sent to um, an out of hospital second reader. Um, and that is a fully qualified dermatologist, but it's not a dermatologist who's employed by UHB. Um, <clears throat> and so there is a chance that this second reader can overturn the, um, the AI decision or if they're happy with the AI output, they can um, discharge the patient. Uh, on the flip side, if the lesion is high risk, they would go through to dermato the UHB dermatology and they can be sent straight to biopsy or they can be um, scheduled for a, for a further appointment. Um, and so this was all part of kind of the, the mapping stage, trying to understand how is the AI deployed, who, which kind of stakeholders interact with um, the, the care pathway, um, but then also what sort of stakeholders would be necessary for us to perform the audit? So who, who do we need to, to collaborate with to truly understand how safe this AI deployment uh, is in, in, in UHB? Um, we also looked at what sort of resources we would need for the audit um, and what sort of uh, technical files or um, evidence we need to interrogate, uh, including any of the, the data that's available. And I will um, flash up um, some of that on the next screen. Um, and then ideally, we'd want to map out some of the AI system itself. However, that's where um, quite often, I think not in not just in this case, but quite often we would have difficulty um, getting the exact details just because of um, uh, potential IP related issues uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and lastly, we also mapped out the risks of the, um, the AI care pathway. Um, and again, that was done in collaboration with um, Skin Analytics. Um, so the, the third stage is the artifact collection stage, and this is essentially um, the audit team um, making a list of all of the different um, sources of evidence that we want to interrogate. I'm going to flip past this one. As you can imagine, it's quite a lot to go through. But in broad terms, um, this is essentially all of the different um, uh, files or reports that we had access to um, and, and managed to, to review. And this is everything that really informed um, some of the, 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 the latter stages in the audit and also our reflective process at the end. 
Um, so in terms of the, the testing of, of these kind of, of this algorithm in particular, we, we worked with Skin Analytics um, who provide quarterly performance reports. And we essentially looked at how the algorithm was performing. Um, apologies, I have had to redact some of the data on this slide, but we essentially looked at the sensitivity and specificity as a start, and then really dive, uh, dove down into the um, number of false positives, false negatives, and what sort of um, lesions uh, were kind of in, in those uh, different groups. And this was mainly, this was essentially part of an exploratory error analysis. So we're looking at, um, okay, there's X number of false negatives, X number of false positives, but what kind of, what kind of images are we actually talking about? And what kind of outcomes um, would they have led to for patients? Um, we were also very interested in subgroup performance. And again, that is something that is described in the medical algorithmic audit framework. Um, and this is essentially looking at two different things. One is the patient specific subgroup and one is the task specific subgroup. So in terms of the patient specific subgroup analysis, um, we did have access to some data. However, um, it became very clear quite early on that actually it's difficult to monitor the subgroup performance data because of a, a lack of data, uh, lack of data itself due to kind of the, the smaller sample sizes when you dive down into subgroups. Um, and B, actually, we just weren't collecting some of this data. Um, and so we've had discussions with Skin Analytics and the uh, digital transformation team to actually understand um, how we can try to collect this data more accurately. Um, but one other thing about subgroup analysis that we're currently um, kind of grappling with is really trying to understand how to predefine these groups. Um, and so that is something that, that I'm looking at as part of my um, mixed methods research and, and part of the qualitative work stream. Um, so what we did manage to do is actually map out the current UHB deployment and the type, the characteristics of those patients and compare it against a diagnostic test accuracy that was conducted by Skin Analytics. Um, and so that was, I think, a good start, but there's more work to be done here. Um, and, and we are exploring that. Um, and so just the last, last couple of slides. Um, so the, the next bit was actually looking at a task specific subgroup analysis. And this is really looking at, okay, so we, 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 we've, so the patient specific subgroup analysis is looking at what sort of patient factors might affect the performance of um, the algorithm. This is very much looking at how the algorithm performs for different tasks. And some of these tasks are um, how does the algorithm perform for melanomas versus squamous cell carcinomas versus BCCs and other pre-malignant lesions? Um, and we were essentially looking at um, the decision to refer. So um, we were monitoring how well does the AI algorithm pick up um, malignancy versus um, malignancy or pre-malignancy versus um, benign lesions. Um, and so that was essentially us trying to break down the different types of lesion as part of the task specific subgroup analysis. Um, and so the last the last stage of this, and I appreciate it's a, quite a quick tour through the, the whole thing. So I'm again, I'm happy to take questions afterwards, but the the in terms of reflection, we essentially went through and looked at all of the different things, all the different reports and evidence that we'd reviewed and some of the outcomes of the, the test phases um, and came up with a few different actions, um, some of which we are in the process of, um, of going through. So the first was really on the developer side, the, so Skin Analytics in response to some of this um, did some more education and training of the teledermatology staff in terms of their data collection and ensuring that a lot of the uh, data is being collected accurately, such as retraining on how to uh, detect Fitzpatrick skin type, which is a very subjective um, but potentially useful um, useful factor or data point to collect. Um, we, al we also um, are looking at the collection and streaming of subgroup data um, and, and how the quarterly performance reports need to be modified. Um, and this all links in with some of our actions that we're, we're taking in UHB in terms of ensuring that um, a lot of this um, 
data is audit ready, as it were. Um, and that's one of the things that, that we're really focusing on at the moment, trying to understand how the data needs to be streamed, what data needs to be linked um, in order for these kind of this kind of algorithm to be um, to, to be monitored effectively. Um, and so just in summary, um, some of our key learning is that uh, I th we think that the medical algorithmic audit framework can provide safety assurance to key stakeholders based on feedback from various stakeholders that we've circulated the report to. Um, some of the components of the medical alg algorithmic audit are already being undertaken internally by device manufacturers, not just skin analytics, um, but others too. Um, and through discussion with these different stakeholders and members of um, UHB, um, we think that local governance of AI should potentially have a role in providing key feedback signals to device manufacturers and regulators. And so our next steps are really to look at further case studies of applying the medical algorithmic audit and exploring how the medical algorithmic audit performs with some uh, qualitative work um, involving various different stakeholders. Um, and, and, and ultimately, you want to understand how to share safety data and um, key learning to ensure that the right the right evidence and the right data is going through the feedback me mechanisms to the people who um, to the people who need to receive it. Um, that's everything I wanted to go through today. Uh, hopefully, I've kept relatively to time, and I'm more than happy to take questions.